Well, today is Palm Sunday, and nearly 2,000 years ago, a large crowd was eagerly gathered outside the eastern gate of Jerusalem to enthusiastically welcome Jesus of Nazareth, who came in seated on the foal of a donkey, crying out, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest, Hosanna, just as the Old Testament Psalms had taught them to sing. And they did this because they expected Jesus, as their anticipated Messiah, to come and to overthrow the Romans, to free them from Roman oppression, to establish a reign of righteousness, and to bring God's blessing back upon God's people. And so, of course, they were enthusiastic. Had they known that five days later he would be crucified as a criminal, they would not have been so eager or so enthusiastic or likely even gathered at all except perhaps to mourn. Uh, We don't celebrate the execution of our heroes, nor do we take the implements of their execution and herald them. Uh, On November 22nd, 1963, the crowds at Love Field would be less enthusiastic had they known that less than an hour later, John F. Kennedy would be shot in Dealey Plaza in downtown Dallas. Uh, People tomorrow won't be celebrating the entrance of Martin Luther King into Memphis in 1968, knowing that just one day later, he would be shot on the balcony of a hotel. Nor do fans of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King tattoo rifles on their bodies or hang them on their buildings or use them as their banners because we don't celebrate the execution of our heroes and we don't herald the implements of their execution normally. But we do. We celebrate this day as Palm Sunday when they laid those palms down on the path of Jesus' feet in honoring of Him And we, 2,000 years later, celebrate this precisely because we know that five days later he would be hung on a tree. And we do put the cross on our buildings, on our Bibles, on our books, and on our bodies because this is the symbol of of Christianity, this implement of torture and of execution. And people don't do this with nooses and with uh, guillotines and with execution walls and with other implements of execution, but we do. And that's odd and that's strange. and We've lost sight of it because it's become so familiar. And so this morning we want to look at the boasting of the cross that we are called to as Christians. And so I invite you to turn to the epistle of Galatians chapter 6 verses 11 through 18. This is the concluding section of the first epistle that the apostle Paul wrote to a group of churches in the Roman region of Galatia in the southern part of modern-day Turkey. And what Paul is going to show us in this closing section is the importance of boasting in the cross, the alternative to boasting in the cross, reasons for boasting in the cross, the cost of boasting in the cross, and the grace to those who boast in the cross. Would you join me in an opening word of prayer as we prepare to study this beautiful passage? Father, we do thank you for the cross of Christ. And in this season especially, we turn our minds away from whatever is distracting us, diverting us, whatever may be causing us anxiety or eagerness. Lord, even from the anticipation of family gatherings and meals and uh, seasonal events for children. Lord, this is a time when we reflect on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ on a cross, on Golgotha, nearly 2,000 years ago, and why we continue to celebrate this event annually. Because it was through that cross that we were forgiven, that we were pardoned, that we were redeemed, that we were saved, and that we have the hope of heaven. And so, Lord, as we enter into this holy week, anticipating Good Friday on Friday, and then Easter Sunday a week from now, would you turn distracted minds and diverted focus onto the truth of the gospel, of the sending of a son of God to become a man, to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, to rise from the grave, to give us the hope of heaven. So help us be mindful of that through this passage this morning, we ask in your son's name. Amen. Verse 11. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. I first encountered this verse as a middle school student when a smart aleck took my annual. Do they still have annuals with the photos that you sign on the back? Many of us have those. And this person with giant letters signed their name and then put Galatians 6.11 at the back. 
And so for the first time, I turned in my Bibles and read, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but Paul was not being cute. Paul was not just writing with flair. There's three things going on here. One is it was common in the ancient world for a person to dictate to a scribe known as an amanuensis, if you want to impress your friends. And then at the end of that letter that they dictated, they would sign it. So today, assistants will sometimes take notation for an executive, prepare the document, bring it in for their signature, so that the recipient can have some assurance that the person who claims to be the sender of this document actually is the author of this document, even if they didn't actually prepare the document, because there's something in their own handwriting that I could recognize. And so that, it, there's an authentication, there's a validation that's going on here. Secondly, there's a personal note to adding a personal note. So some of you send out Christmas letters or you come back from a trip and send out newsletters and you're not going to hand write 100 copies. So what do you do? At the bottom, you'll write a personal note to let them know that you didn't write the whole page, the printer did that work for you, but you wrote a personal note to them. And so Paul sometimes at the end of his letters will quill in hand, write a personal note, and he gives a benediction or a greeting or just a word of, I'm coming to you soon. And so for example, in Colossians 4.18, Paul says, I, Paul, write this greeting to you with my own hand. 2 Thessalonians 3.17, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. 1 Corinthians 16.21, the greeting is in my own hand, Paul. And then he goes on to give several uh, greetings and blessings. Philemon 19, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. And then he goes on for five verses to give greetings and blessings and personal notes. So this is something we often overlook because they're tagged on at the end of our letters, but this is actually significant. And the third reason that this is especially important here is for emphasis. This is the longest handwritten portion of any of Paul's letters. And it's not just personally written in long, it's in large letters. And that's not because Paul was poor of handwriting or bad eyesight or I read one commentator said that maybe he was mocking the Galatians because they were quick to abandon the gospel and he was like treating them like children and drawing with large letters. That's not it at all. Back before the day when you could put something in bold font or all caps, because all, all letters would have been capitalized at this time. They were all majuscules, not minuscules to you seminarians out there. Uh, there was no turning it bold red. The way that you would give a special emphasis was one, by doing it in your own hand, but then two, by making the letter somewhat larger. So the significance of this verse is Paul has said to the scribe, hey, give me that quill, <laughs> give me that ink quill. I need to write this. And it's more than just a personal note. It's not just sending a greeting. It's not just adding a benediction or a blessing. I need in large letters to emphasize key points of this, of this letter that I've written, that at the end of six chapters, I need to make sure that they don't miss the importance of this. And so this is authenticating, this is personalizing, and this is emphasizing what I'm about to write. Pay attention. This is important. So what is it that he writes? First of all, he rebukes those who would boast in anything other than the cross. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that you may boast in your flesh. Now, this group of people is known today as the Judaizers. And these were people of Jewish heritage who professed Jesus as the Messiah, but also insisted on keeping the law of Moses. So circumcision was a sign given to Abraham of the God's covenant people that you would circumcise the males on the eighth day as a sign of those who belong to God. This became part of the Mosaic law. And if you were a Gentile entering into Judaism as a proselyte, you would require to be circumcised and then you would be required to adhere to the Mosaic law. Well, some of these people who were impressed by Jesus and his claims to be the Messiah, as the gospel went out into the Gentile world beyond Jewish circle says, okay, we'll accept these Gentiles, but only if they're circumcised to become part of God's people. And therefore, if they will keep the law of Moses, because we like Jesus, but we want to keep Moses. It's Moses plus Jesus, Jesus and Moses, rather than Moses, then Jesus. 
And at the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses appeared at the elbow of Jesus to indicate that the old covenant was giving away to the new. There was a transferal. There was a moving from the old covenant to the new. There was, Moses was always a temporary to tutor to lead until the time of the Messiah. But there were some that was, that's hard to let go of. And, th and that's natural. If someone came to Christ from a Hindu background, it's hard to believe you could actually eat meat. Or for a Messianic Jew to actually believe it's okay to eat pork. Uh, it's hard for Buddhists who become believers to stop praying to their ancestors. That natural heritage is strong. And the assumption is, well, I'll keep this and add some Jesus. I'll keep this because that's acceptable to my family and my peer group and to, to my world up to this point. But then I'll add some Jesus as well. Uh, and that's not always bad, as long as it's not an addition to the gospel or lead to a compromise of biblical truth, or if it's insisting on something that the Bible doesn't insist on. Now, I had a seminary professor who said he was 55 years old at the time, and to that day, every time he watches a movie, he feels his fundamentalist grandmother frowning down on him and wagging her finger for watching those moving, talking pictures. And he just grew up in his background, you don't watch movies. And to this day, he knows better, depending on the content, but it, it, he, that was strong. And so it's understandable while this was here. Paul critiques them on the basis of their motives and then also their model. Their motives weren't right and their model was hypocritical. Let's deal with the motives. Pride and fear. Look again at verse 12. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh, to brag on their own abilities, what they've been accomplishing, try to compel you to be circumcised, you Gentile converts, simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. There is this bragging, this boasting of, look at all my trophies. Look at how many Gentile converts I was able to persuade to adhere to the law of Moses. And then that gave them some margin with their peer group of, and therefore, even though I'm accepting Jesus as the Messiah, please don't kick me out of the synagogue. Please don't shun me as my family. Please continue to give business to my business. Please don't raise up mobs to stone me. And all of these things were real threats because all of these things happened to Paul and to others. There was a cost to embracing Jesus then like there's a cost to embracing Jesus now. And the way that you could give yourself some margin is, let me show you that I'm so zeal so zealous. So if you were a convert to Christianity in a strong uh, Muslim culture, if you continued to show up at certain places on Friday, if you continued to fast in a certain period of uh, time in Ramadan, if you continued to not do certain things like eat pork, maybe that would give you some buffer, some margin. And by showing zeal here, you could give yourself some space here. And that's what they were doing. But pride and fear are both self-oriented, either self-promotion or self-preservation. And they take the boast from God and put it in ourselves. And so Paul says, that's not good. The alternative to the cross can't be anything of ourselves, anything that draws attention to our church attendance, our church involvement, our Bible knowledge, our theological sophistication, the number of people that we've witnessed to, the number of people that follow our blogs or that buy our books or that attend our events. There's nothing that we can do that we should be boasting in because all that's only of God. And there's a fine line between giving God all the credit for what God is doing and then somehow saying, hey, look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at how many people came to this, how many people signed this, how many people filled out this card, how many people walked forward at an invitation. And not just for ministers, but for lay. You know, look how much Bible I know, how many gold stars I have on my book. Look at the way I'm raising my children. And we have this inclination, this instinct to draw attention to ourselves as though we had anything to boast in. And Paul says, no, there is no biblical alternative to boasting in the cross. And then likewise, their hypocrisy. Look at their, mo their motive. Those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves. They're telling you to do something that they're not doing. They're telling you to obey something that they're not obeying. They're hypocrites. And of course, when it comes to self-righteous religion, we all fall short. We're all hypocritical to some degree. God is perfect. No one else is perfect. Therefore, no one can be perfect enough to please a perfect God. God is perfectly holy and we are not. God is perfectly righteous and we are not. God is perfectly loving and we are not. 
And therefore, any attempt on anybody's part to claim to earn or merit or deserve God's favor is folly. And it's blasphemy. And it's disrespectful. And it's hypocrisy. And so Paul says, no one should boast in anything with regards to salvation other than the cross of Christ where God accomplished salvation because our motives are wrong, either self-promoting or self-preserving, and none of us meet the standards that deserves any type of a claim to ourselves. It's all of God, none of us. Which is why Paul says, we boast in the cross alone. Look at verse 14 through 16. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything or uncircumcision, or uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now, we write songs about, may, I, may it never be that I should boast except to save in the cross of Christ my Lord. What, what hymn is that? All the vain things that charm me the most, I sacrifice them to. We write songs about it, poems about it, books about it. It's familiar. But at that time, according to Cicero, a Roman, you don't even mention the word cross in decent company because that brought to mind images of naked men and women being slowly tortured to death. Uh, even in Christian circles, some of the early references don't use the word cross. They talk about hung on that shameful tree because this was worse than a gas chamber. This was worse than a lethal injection. This was worse than a firing squad. This was worse than a gallows. Uh, the Cotton Patch Gospel talked about, I will boast in nothing but the lynching of Jesus, which kind of gives a different connotation, doesn't it? But that's what it would have meant to first century ears. And so why on earth would Paul be boasting in the cross of Jesus and only boasting in the cross of Jesus? Because it's through the cross of Jesus that God saves us. The gateway to heaven is cross-shaped. The, the gates of hell are unlocked with a cross-shaped key. And it's on the cross that God sacrificed His Son on our behalf so that our sins could be forgiven, so that His righteous wrath would be satisfied, so that we could be declared righteous even though that we were unrighteous, so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be adopted, so that we could be reconciled. All these glorious aspects of the atonement, of our salvation, came at the cost of the cross. And that's why it's our boast. That's why we put it on our buildings. That's why we tattoo it on our bodies. That's why we dedicate sermons to it because that is God's provision for our salvation and there is no other. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And that means through his cross, which means through his crucifixion, through his sacrificial death as our substitute so that we could be saved. That's what's going on here. Uh, I know there's several readers in here. One of the best books that you could read on the cross is called The Cross of Christ by John Stott. I'm going to read a page of this that hopefully will uh, get many of you all going to your Amazon accounts. If you would like something a little shorter for devotional reading this week, John Piper has a shorter book called 50 Reasons Why Jesus Came to Die that would make marvelous devotional reflections during this holy week and then also as we proceed towards Pentecost. So 50 reasons why Jesus came to die. But let me read to you from John Stott's Cross of Christ. And he highlights when he looks at the cross four key aspects of our salvation. Namely, that there was propitiation, which is a fancy word that God's righteous wrath was satisfied when it fell on Christ. He intervened his precious blood between God's holy wrath and us. Redemption of our being bought out of our bondage to sin and death and hell and Satan by the purchase price of Christ. Our justification, where God the judge declares us righteous, not because we're righteous, but because the perfect righteousness of Christ is reckoned to our account, that he co-signed for us. And then reconciliation, that we were separated from God, we were estranged from God, we were alienated, we were enemies, and God brought us back into union through Jesus Christ. Those are the four key aspects that he dwells on in this book. And he highlights three themes that they have in common. First, each highlights a different aspect of our human need. 
Propitiation underscores the wrath of God upon us. Redemption, our captivity to sin. Justification, our guilt. And reconciliation, our enmity against God and our alienation from Him. These metaphors do not flatter us. <laughs> they expose the magnitude of our need. Second, all four images emphasize that the saving initiative was taken by God because of His love. It was God who satisfied His own wrath, redeemed us from our miserable bondage, declared us righteous in His sight, and reconciles us to Himself. The text leaves no doubt about this. God loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 4.10. God has come and redeemed His people, Luke 1.68. It is God who justifies, Romans 8.33. God reconciled us to Himself through Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.18. It's all God. It's God's initiative, God's work, which is why God gets all the glory. We contributed nothing to it. We were helpless. We were guilty. We deserved nothing. And God, in His mercy and His compassion and His love, reached down in grace at the cost of His own Son and snatched us out, which is why we boast in the cross. Third, all four images plainly teach that God's saving work was achieved through the shedding of blood, through the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. Again, the texts are unequivocal. God presented Jesus as a propitiatory sacrifice through faith in His blood, Romans 3.25. In Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, Ephesians 1.7. We have now been justified by redemption through His blood, Ephesians 1, 7, worth repeating. We have now been justified by His blood, Romans 5, 9. You who once were far away have been brought near, reconciled through the blood of Christ, Ephesians 2, 13. Christ's blood is a symbol of His life laid down for us in violent death. He died in our substitute. He died in our place. The death of Jesus was the atoning sacrifice because of which God averted His wrath from us. It is the ransom price by which we have been redeemed. It is the condemnation of the innocent that the guilty might be justified. And it is the sacrifice of the sinless one so that he would be made a sinful sacrifice for us. The Son of our God died that we sinners could be adopted as sons and daughters of God. All that's on the cross. And that's why we boast in the cross and only boast in the cross and always and ever boast in the cross no matter the cost. And Paul goes on to give several other reasons for this. Uh, already up to now in the book of Galatians, he's emphasized the salvation by grace through faith because of Jesus' death on the cross. In Galatians 1 through, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might rescue us from this present evil age. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even as we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Galatians 2.19 Through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and therefore gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. If we could have saved ourselves by obeying the law, then God need not have sacrificed his Son. The fact that he went to that extent, to that extreme, that the jewel of heaven died for us means there was no other way. There was no other way for us to be saved but through Jesus and His death. Galatians 3.13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, because He died on the cross for us. So we boast on the cross. But he gives three other reasons in this text. The first is in verse 14. We boast in the Christ because through it the world has been crucified to us and we to the world. When we believe Jesus as our Savior, when we embrace Him as our Savior, we are identified with Him in His death and His re resurrection. And when He died on the cross, we were in a sense with Him because there's actually three crucifixions here, aren't there? 
There is Christ crucified, there is the world crucified, and there is the Christian crucified. So what does this mean? What Paul's talking about isn't that this world is the creation that God made good. So we sing, this is my father's world. But the world oftentimes is scripture is the rebelliousness and the sinners rising up against their creator. The world is used in a negative sense. So when it says, for God so loved the world, that doesn't mean the birds and the bees and the flowers. It means he loved the sinful world enough to send his son. And there's a distinction drawn between those who are still in the world because they belong to the world versus those who have been transferred out of the world through Jesus. Paul says, The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. Jesus said in John 15, 18, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But you're not of the world. I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. In John 17, he prays, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We have a new identity. We have been made citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Because Christ died, he transferred us out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. And now there's a a distinction between us and the world that's going to be a saving distinction someday. So as an analogy, there's several servicemen in here. And when you signed your enlistment papers and took your oath of enlistment, in a sense, you became part of another world. And now you had to adhere to a new code of law. You followed the military, military code of justice. If you violated it, you were going to be appointed before the judicial advocacy What's JAG? What's the G in JAG? General. General, thank you. You had your own court system. You had your own laws. You had your own ethical system. You became a citizen of another entity the moment you signed that paper and swore that oath. Well, in a similar way, when we embrace Christ, we no longer are citizens of this world in that worldly way. We're citizens of heaven. We're no longer sons of disobedience. We're sons and daughters of God. We no longer belong to this old order. We belong to this new order. And so we boast in the cross of Christ because it's by it that we get our new identity as God's citizens, as God's children, and as members of the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's one reason. Second, verse 15. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision anything, but a new creation. It's not this old religious ritual, whether you adhere to it or not. It's not this religious ceremony, whether you do it or not. What's significant is that there is a new creation. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. The Old Testament is called that because it contains the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant. The New Testament is called that because it contains the New Covenant. And with this New Covenant was the sending of the Holy Spirit to take hearts of stone and change them into hearts of flesh. To take people who were dead to God and the things of God and to make us sensitive to the things of God. To give us life from above. Spiritual rebirth. God gives us a new identity. He gives us a new name. He gives us a new family. He gives us a new citizenship. He gives us a new nature with new loves and new desires and new aspirations. He gives us a new faith and a new hope and a new love. And all of these things that we hope in, the hope one day that we will be in new bodies on a new heavens and a new earth to reign in the presence of Christ forever and ever, that that is salvation. That came through Jesus' death on the cross. When we celebrate communion in a little bit, we're going to recall the words that At the Last Supper, on the night before his crucifixion, it was then that he announced that he was instituting a new covenant in his blood. That old died when Jesus died so that the new could come when he rose. And because new creation is what salvation is all about, that's why we boast in Christ. Unless the grain falls and dies, it doesn't come to life as wheat. Unless the old dies, the new doesn't come to life. So we boast in the cross of Christ because it is through that that there is a new creation. A third reason that we boast in the cross 
And those who will walk by this rule, those who will live by this gospel, this standard, this principle, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Those who decide to live their lives according to this good news, that even though we are sinners, if we will repent of our sins and embrace Jesus Christ as our Savior because of His death on the cross, if we'll put our hope in Him and not in ourselves, if we'll boast in His cross and not in our righteousness, then we have peace with God. He's not angry at us anymore. We're not enemies, any, we're not enemies anymore. We're not alienated and estranged anymore. The fathers embrace the prodigal and He puts the robe on us because He welcomes us home. There's peace to those who embrace the gospel of God. And you don't have to fear judgment day anymore because judgment has already fallen on Christ at, on Calvary. And likewise, there is mercy that all of us fail God daily in the things that we should have done that we don't and the things that we shouldn't do that we do in our impure hearts and thoughts and motives and our hurtful and slanderous speech. We fail God daily. We fall short of the glory of God daily. And you know what he does? He extends mercy upon mercy, grace upon grace, because we've been adopted as His children and He'll never disown us or disinherit us. That came because of the cross. Therefore, we boast in the cross. Now, this last phrase, the Israel of God, there have been uh, thousands of gallons of ink spilt on whether or not this is referring to the church, uh, Jews and Gentiles who are saved in Jesus, or perhaps to the remnant of Israel, that God has promised to redeem someday. You could read Romans 11 about that. We're not going to go into depth into that debate, but rather emphasize what both sides would agree on, namely that we boast in the cross of Christ alone because it is through the crucifixion of Jesus that we have peace with God and experience the mercy of God. I see some frustrated seminarians back there. We'll talk about it offline. <laughs> Next, the cost of boasting in the cross. Look at verse 17. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. Now, this word brand marks is the word stigmata. So you may have seen books, seen movies, heard of the things about the stigmata. And normally we associate it with the spiritual stigmata, the mystical or miraculous, depending on your assessment, signs of the cross on the, the body of a saint. The first person to whom this supposedly occurred was St. Francis of Assisi, who in Tuscany, Italy, in uh, 1224, knelt down, knelt down at daybreak. And according to the little flowers of St. Francis, uh, the accounts of his life, a seraphim appeared and came upon his body. And as he meditated on the passion of Christ, on the death of Jesus, there appeared on his body the signs of the cross and nail marks on his hands, on his feet, in his side. Other accounts sometimes had thorns on the head. And as he came out of whatever experience he had for the rest of his life, he apparently had the nail prints on his hands and feet, on his side, and then on certain other accounts. There's been about 400 people who have claimed this experience, about 350 women and about 40-something men. It's a seven-to-one ratio, female to male, for whatever reason. Uh, and in the, in the case of St. Francis, they said that for the rest of his life, sometimes it would just sporadically start bleeding. Now, whatever we make of this, if you choose to try to make anything of it, what we can say here is that's not what's going on here. So Paul is not talking about the mystical signs of the cross on his body. But rather, the word stigmata in the first century referred to an identification marker, either a tattoo or a brand, placed on an animal, a soldier, a criminal, a slave, or a religious zealot. So sometimes they were tattooed. The original word meant to pierce or to poke. But then they also, you could apply a heated implement, and it was an identifying marker. What Paul is referring to is that because he has suffered for the cross of Christ, for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, he bears on his body the bruises and the dents and the uh, scars of the beatings and the lashings and the stonings that he's undergone. And so when Paul had the vision of Christ on his way to Damascus, as soon as he regained his vision and was baptized, he began preaching Jesus, and immediately they started seeking his death. And then he went to Jerusalem, and they sought his death. And on the first missionary journey, and Galatians is written right after that, he was stoned, they assumed he was dead, they drug him outside the city 
and he revived, went to the next city, and he preached again. In the book of 2 Corinthians, he talks about being beaten, being bashed with rods three times, having received 49 lashes from the Jews, having been, and he goes through this long litany, and on top of all that is the constant worry for the saints around the world. And when you looked at Paul, he didn't look good. <laughs> And he had joints out of place, and he had abrasions and scars. And if you ran you know, your hand across his head, you could see bumps that shouldn't be there and indentations that shouldn't be there. And he said to those who persecuted him, who tried to come in and try to preach against him or to undo the work he had done, don't trouble me anymore. Because you want to talk about brand marks, identifying marks like circumcision? I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus because I have suffered for Jesus, as people do today. According to Open Doors, there are 360 million Christians currently living where persecution against them is significant. Last year, 2022, there were approximately 5,600 Christians murdered because they were Christians, 6,000 detained or imprisoned, 4,000 kidnapped, and over 5,000 churches and religious buildings destroyed. There is active, open persecution going on right now. There are places in the world that they couldn't gather as a group of 250 and sing openly and loudly with amplification because it wouldn't be safe to do so. And they're doing that right now. And some of them bear on their bodies the brand marks, the stigmata of Jesus Christ. Uh, in Canada and in England, there have been people arrested for praying and for preaching the gospel and for teaching biblical truth. And although we're not quite yet there in America, there are people who have been harassed with lawsuits and who have been slandered and have had their books banned on certain sites and have had their access to social media and websites canceled and have had other things. And there is going to be growing persecution for Christians in America. And there will be the temptation like there was then. It's so easy. If I just signal the right virtues, if I just don't say this and keep this private, if I don't just verbalize this, but remain silent. If I just go along with this, if I just tweak this, modify this, say this, accept that, compromise here, then I can get along. And the description that Reinhold Niebuhr gave, or actually H. Richard Niebuhr, the tack that liberal Christianity took, that a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. As long as we'll say that, that God is good and nice, that He's just a, a benevolent grandfather who loves everybody, likes everybody, isn't going to judge anything. Go, Jesus was a good man, but He's not the only way. As long as we will back off of all the essential truths of the gospel, we can avoid persecution. But that's not an acceptable option for us because we know that there is a God who is wrathful at sin. And we know that we are sinners and not righteous. And we know that Jesus came as the Son of God to die on our behalf, and there is no way to avoid the judgment of God sentencing us to hell apart from faith in Jesus Christ. And those are hard realities, but they're realities. And those are uncomfortable truths, but they're truths. And we're bound to the gospel, we're bound to scriptures, and so we're willing to take the cost. And we do so knowing that there is grace to those who boast in the cross of Christ. Look at verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. So Paul's talked about the importance of boasting in the cross, verse 11. He took the quill out of the scribe's hand to emphasize this in personal large letters. He rebuked those who would boast in anything apart from the cross, any self-righteousness, any accomplishment, any achievement. He offered various reasons for boasting in the cross, acknowledging that there's a cost for doing so. But there's grace. There's grace. There is God's favor on us. There is God looking favorably on us. There is God's enabling mercy in us. There is God's comfort and consolation for us if we are in Christ. If we have said, God, you are holy and I am not, and I give up any pretensions of deserving or ever earning or adding anything to my own salvation, I believe that Jesus is your son, that you sent to become a man, I believe that he lived a perfect life that I could never live on my behalf. I believe that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for the sins that I committed. I believe that he rose again on the third day and that if I will repent of my sins and embrace him as my Savior, I will rise too. 
that I will go into that grave and I will rise someday because of Christ. We believe that, we affirm that, and therefore we have the grace of Christ. Amen. Today's Palm Sunday. 2,000 years ago, a crowd gathered outside the eastern gate of Jerusalem to enthusiastically greet Jesus of Nazareth, seated on the foal of a donkey, because they expected him to come and to rule as the messianic king and to establish a reign of righteousness. They did not know that he would be hung on a cross five days further. We do, and therefore we boast on the cross. Therefore we brag on Jesus. Therefore, we confidently express that all of our trust and all of our reliance in being right before a holy God lies in Christ and Him crucified. And we reflect on that. We adore Him because of that. We cling to that no matter what the pressure around us. And we share that good news with others who need it, even if they don't want to hear it, because we know that this is the antidote to death. This is the doorway to heaven. It's the cross of Christ, and we boast in the cross. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this great text that Paul felt compelled to grab the pen himself and with large letters to remind us of where our hope truly lies. And it's not in the fact that we grew up in Christian homes. It's not in the fact that we've undergone baptism or confirmation. It's not because we are relatively better than the people around us, or at least we think we are. Our hope of heaven lies solely in the fact that you sent your son to live and die and rise for us. And so we boast in that because the cross highlights your holiness. You would not compromise your character. It highlights your love. You were willing to sacrifice even your son to save sinners like, sinners like us. It highlights your grace and your mercy because you offer this indiscriminately to the undeserving. And so Father, this week, help us to focus on the cross of Christ. And as we host family members for lunches next week, as we talk to co-workers about this holy week, would you give us the courage, the confidence, the eagerness to boast in the cross of Christ that saves us and that will save them too. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>